Okay, thank you to all those who joined us this afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, welcome. This is the fourth lecture in the Admiral James W. Nance Foreign Policy Lecture Series. This is our first virtual lecture presented by the Jesse Helm Center. I'm Jeff Atkinson, Vice President here at the Helm Center in Wingate, North Carolina. We are all in for a real treat this afternoon. We'll introduce today's featured speaker in just a moment, but first we'd like to have a few words from the president of the Jesse Helm Center, Brian Rogers. Brian. Here we are. I wish we could all be in person, but uh, soon keep the faith. Uh, we're excited to welcome Dr. Pillsbury uh, with us, and we'll do a formal introduction with him in a, in a minute. And uh, he's got some wonderful uh, things to share with us, and, and a really rich history with Senator Helms. And we're blessed to have you, Dr. Pillsbury. I wanted to uh, first off welcome you. This is part of our Nance lecture series. Uh, that we kicked off in 2019. We got a little delayed last year due to COVID and a very heated uh, election season. So we're uh, starting fresh in 2021 and we have a lot of neat events planned, but I thought I would just uh, take a minute and just give you a history and understanding of why we have a series named after Admiral Nance. Uh, so James Wilson Bud Nance, as he was referred to by many, actually was born right down the road from the Jesse Helm Center in a little town called Monroe, North Carolina, 1921, the same year in the same hometown as Senator Helms. Uh, they both attended Monroe High School, even played in the same marching band together, where it was Nance on the clarinet and Helms on the tuba, if you can imagine that. Also in their class, which was kind of interesting, is a gentleman named Henry Hall Wilson, who became chairman of the Chicago Board of Trade and the administrative assistant to President uh, Kennedy and Johnson. So quite a uh, unique small town uh, class. Admiral Nance uh, attended North Carolina State University before he finished uh, at the Naval Academy. In 1944, he was assigned to the USS North Carolina throughout the remainder of World War II. At the conclusion of World War II, uh, Admiral Nance trained and served as a flight instructor at the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, after serving other tours as a test pilot on aircraft carriers, uh, Nance served as a Naval officer on the staff of the commander of US forces in Europe under General Alexander Haig. You might recognize that name. Uh, he attained the rank of Rear Admiral in 1970. Uh, his last tour of duty was as Assistant Vice Chief of Naval Operations, and Admiral Nance uh, also commanded towards the end of his career the USS Forrestal and was a veteran of World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam. He was awarded two Distinguished Service Medals and the Legion of Honor. So upon retiring from the Navy in 1979, uh, Admiral Nance served as President Reagan's Deputy Assistant for National Security Affairs. And then in 1991, when he really was retired, uh, his old friend Jesse Helms came calling and asked if he would serve come out of retirement and serve as the uh, staff director for the Foreign Relations Committee on the minority side at the time. Well, in 1995, Helms uh, was officially named chairman uh, of the Foreign Relations Committee and Admiral Nance served as the chief of staff to the committee. Uh, when he came on the committee, he wanted to work at no cost, but under Senate rules, he had to take a salary. So he was paid Congress's then minimum wage, and how interesting today, uh, but their minimum wage in 1991 Congress for a week was $2.96. Uh, later, after a few cost of living increases, it was bumped to $4.53 a week. And Senator Helms often joked, he's worth every penny. <laughs> so, Admiral Nance wasted little time and put the task before him of 
overhauling uh, the, the Senate foreign relations staff, releasing a lot of deadwood and malcontents and hiring young conservatives like Steve Billion and uh, shifting people around. Unfortunately, in 1999, we lost Admiral Nance to cancer. He was buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery. Senators from both sides of the aisle, including then Clinton Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, uh, attended his funeral, which is testament to the respect each had towards Admiral Nance. I know Senator Helms and Mrs. Helms would be so proud to, to know we have a lecture series uh, in his honor, in his name, a foreign uh, affairs lecture series. He was such a kind man. I had the privilege of knowing him and I'm sure Dr. Pillsbury did too. And he was, he had such a quality uh, presence and, and really a man full of grace and humility. Um, but overall, this lecture series simply wouldn't be possible without our friends at the John William Pope Foundation. And we are so thankful for them and allowing us to, to honor such a great man and tackle such important issues uh, that, that uh, face our country. So we're honored that you're here. We are recording this and we'll, we'll share to, to others too that I know could not make it, but uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Jeff Atkinson, who's new to the Helm Center. He serves as my vice president and um, is, a, is a great colleague and a friend uh, known him for a long time, and and so we're pleased to have Jeff, and, and so he's going to uh, have the liberty of of introducing our introducing our guest speaker. So uh, thank you, and and again welcome. Today's guest speaker, and you'll quickly find about twenty two thousand mentions of his name. The search engine will find about twenty two thousand results with his name in about three tenths of a second. Dr. Michael Pillsbury is not only mentioned in numerous news accounts and publications here in the United States, but also overseas and papers like the Japan Times and South China Morning News and on Radio Free Asia. He's told me he's been a guest on Fox News 300 times. Mike Pillsbury is one of the U.S. government's leading China experts. Former President Trump in a news conference once called him probably the leading authority on China. He is a senior fellow and director for Chinese strategy at Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., a distinguished defense policy advisor, former high-ranking government official, going all the way back to the Reagan administration, and an author of numerous books and reports on China. Most recently, his book, The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace the United States as a Global Superpower. In getting to know Dr. Pillsbury, we have learned that he once worked for Jesse Helms, as Brian mentioned. Here is a picture of the two of them. We wanted to show that to you as well. This was taken in 1987, uh, once we see the picture here, I don't know if you can read the caption, but it says when the picture comes up, Mike, you will always have my respect. Hang in there, Jesse oh. Helms, U.S. Senate. <laughs> Great picture of the two of them from 1987. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, join me now in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Michael Pillsbury. Take it away. Thank you, Jeff. You want me just to start talking? Please do. I thought I'd talk only for about 20 minutes and uh, leave plenty of time for questions. There's not very many participants today. So if we could imagine ourselves around a dining room table, we can have more of a conversation. Um, I have a specialty that I keep hidden, which is being a historian. So I'm always uh, collecting documents and taking notes and uh, visiting presidential libraries to see where archival materials are. And I finally got an offer to, uh, to write a book on the history of US-China relations, uh, basically over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, Senator Jesse Helms only gets about a page in the, in the book, but it's a very interesting page. He warns everybody about Chinese deception and Chinese duplicity. And he issued a report that listed all the agreements that China had broken. And he said, basically, this is a government we should never trust about anything. And I would say just about nobody agreed with him at the time. And not to be indiscreet, but I'm an eyewitness of Admiral Nance and Jesse Helms disagreeing about China more than once. 
And there's a good reason for that. And I'm going to go into it in some detail. And that is what our various presidents have thought we should do about China. Because up until President Trump, it's been pretty consistent. Since Richard Nixon, as I say, up until Trump, the basic idea was we need China. China is like a poor, backward country. Um, our brilliant American initiative will open up this poor, backward country, and we'll get to live together and cooperate in various ways. And as President Nixon had, wrote, had written when he was a candidate for president, we can't leave an angry, hostile China out of the club of the world nations. So this concept, if you take it all the way, it means no matter what kind of warnings Jesse Helms might give, it doesn't matter. We're still trying to bring China into the family of nations. So if they do something bad, it's either a temporary matter or we just have to ask them nicely to stop and never do it again. And my book argues that the Chinese got onto this very early. They did a much better job understanding our politics than we did a job of understanding their politics. We thought basically the reformers in China, again, I go back to Nixon and Dr. Kissinger, in some of their classified materials that have now been released, and I, I was very lucky to get some of these materials for my book, I think that's what helped make it a bestseller because people can't fake historical documents. You're stuck with what you said to Mao or what Mao said to you. And there's a very important point that President Nixon made. He had only one meeting with Chairman Mao. Kissinger had five meetings. And Senator Helms and Admiral Nance fought very hard to find out what happened in those meetings. Did you make any kind of promises? If so, what are they? And President Nixon and uh, Henry Kissinger wrote their interpretation of what they had done with China in best-selling books. And so for 30, almost 40 years, for 35 years, the only knowledge the outside world had of US-China relations was what I've just laid out for you. We've got to welcome them, welcome them into the, uh, the world of other nations, not have them be angry and hostile. They're basically very, very poor and very, very weak. And it'll probably always be that way. That was kind of the unspoken I even found one CIA uh, intelligence estimate of China's economic future. This is dated in the 1960s, although it was repeated years later. China has no economic future. Their policies are so stupid. They are so much of a peasant rural country. They don't understand uh, economics very well. They have very low technology and always have and probably most important, the Chinese, uh, one of the estimates said, have no real interest in economic growth. They have a new kind of ideology that's based on wearing blue suits and riding bicycles and not striving to be a wealthy country. Well, there's been a lot of intelligence failures, but I argue in the book, The 100 Year Marathon, Probably the biggest intelligence failure in our country's history was getting China wrong in the 1970s, and then it continued on into the 80s and 90s, and up until President Trump. Uh, in many ways, the Chinese were able to use this perception that they knew we had of them. So they asked us, could you please turn over all your scientific findings quickly? They asked Kissinger and Nixon that. Nixon said yes, and he signed an order. Every new American scientific discovery funded by our government, we will transfer to China. We will support Chinese membership. The Chinese have broken off all their ties they had in the 1950s with the global uh, physics, chemistry, uh, all the basic scientific associations. They had no students going to school overseas in the 60s. And they asked Nixon and Kissinger, well, could we? send some students? And the answer was yes. 
Now today, there's 400,000 Chinese students, mainly in the hard sciences and engineering schools of our country. So this foundation in the early 1970s had stuck with us. Um, perhaps the most, some of the most extreme examples, I was very lucky that the CIA and Defense Department allowed me to reveal some Chinese espionage intelligence cooperation with the CIA. And most people, you know, no, that can't be. Because today, China appears to be an adversary. It's still communist. So surely, we never had any cooperation with them in covert action or intelligence matters. No, that's not true. It was approved by Henry Kissinger in 1973, and I was involved in the process. That's why I was so happy to get it declassified. That we would defend China. We would provide weapons, ammunition, intelligence to China if they were attacked by the Soviet Union. That was 1973. By the time Admiral Nance became the Deputy National Security Advisor to President Reagan in 1981, the program had greatly expanded. So US intelligence was collecting information from inside China. In 1981, the US, CIA, and China began to cooperate to provide weapons in Cambodia to drive the Vietnamese out. The cooperation increased, I argue in the book, and with a lot of new documents uh, from the CIA and the Pentagon, the cooperation even increased in 82, 83, 84 uh, to provide a billion dollars and then more after that to the Afghan resistance, US-China joint program to drive the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan. So you can imagine if you're Jesse Helms at the time and you're saying that China doesn't keep any agreements, they're filled with duplicity and deception in their policy toward us, that we must protect Taiwan uh, you can imagine what Jesse Helms would have thought if he ever found out about these joint programs, the scientific cooperation. Uh, it got even worse. We sponsored the World Bank to take on China as the largest recipient of World Bank loan money, billions and billions. The Chinese said, we don't have any real economists here. The United States authorized the World Bank to open up its largest office in the world in Beijing and teach the Chinese how to have world's, the world's best growth rate, which they did. So several thousand World Bank staff and economists from around the world tutored the Chinese. The Chinese were very clear at the time. I have a chapter on this where I show how they approached us and the World Bank. And despite what I said earlier, the earlier estimates that China doesn't care about getting rich or high technology. After their reformers began to have more power in 1978, they approached us and said, we actually do want to join the ranks of the advanced countries of the world. What do we have to do to do that? And the formula was presented to them <laughs> and they followed it. So American loans, World Bank loans, um, under Jerry Ford and then Jimmy Carter and the early Reagan years, American companies were authorized to invest in China. Now I have no feedback, Jeff, so I don't know if my words are getting through to your participants or not. We're hearing you uh, wonderful, loud and clear. Okay. <laughs> the, the problem with Zoom and virtual communications is you get no feedback. Right. So you could have your participants uh, all their heads are down on their soup now and they're asleep, or you could have no, they can't hear what I'm saying, but I'm trying to lay the framework for how this all began and how Jesse Helms, uh, by the way, I was on the side of Reagan. I was on the side of Admiral Nance. I believed all this. Some people say the reason the hundred year marathon is a bestseller is it's a panda hugger who was involved in all this effort, who admits he was wrong. 
and I've got a series of book reviews. Some of them are all this, like you, you, you measure your book's popularity by Jeff, by how many book reviews there are on Amazon. Yes. Some books get zero reviews. Some get 10. Dr. Kissinger's got like 800 for his book. <laughs> some people get a thousand reviews. That's considered dynamite. You just As of to... yesterday, I have 1500 reviews of this book. And many of the reviews talk about this guy is either stupid or enormously courageous because nobody in Washington ever admits any mistake. And here he is saying for more than 30 years, he advocated arms sales to China, intelligence cooperation, the World Bank helping, technology transfers. So that's really bad, right? On the other hand, if you wanna know the history of what happened, I have the documents and my own personal account of how it went. So it's a pity we can't have Jesse Helms and Admiral Nance, you know, come up on the screen. And I can say, Admiral Nance, you and I were wrong. We were <laughs> fooled by the right. Chinese. Je Ronald Reagan was misled. Now, Reagan, to his credit, I've got four of his classified documents released for the book. Reagan wrote in his orders, help China, build them up, sell them weapons, which they bought, New intelligence cooperation, transferred science and technology. They're okay for American business. But he said, there's two things we got to be careful about. We have to make sure China stays away from Russia. We don't want a Russia-China combination. Reagan was worried about that. The second thing he said is we've got to make sure China goes toward democracy and political reform. We don't want to endorse the Chinese Communist Party. So Senator Helms had, wasn't all wrong. The President Reagan was in favor of being careful. But generally speaking, that's a rare uh, exception to the general thrust of the 40 years. And the story goes forward. By the time we get into the late 1990s, the US policy community not just liberals, but a lot of conservatives, a lot of businessmen are saying, you know, we need to get China into the World Trade Organization because that'll lower tariffs in China. It'll be really good for American farmers. We can have massive uh, American agricultural exports to China. They're good for American businesses of all types. So the Chinese said, no, we're, we're not going to really sign an agreement that gives away our Communist Party control. But yes, we want to be in the World Trade Organization. We want the countries of the world to all drop their tariffs for us. So which side won, do you think, Jeff? The side that said, hell no, you don't sign the full agreement. Besides, the World Trade Organization had another rule. Only democracies <laughs> can be members. So somebody had to wink at that. So by two-thirds or better majorities in both the House and the Senate, this deal was agreed to. It was a Bill Clinton deal at the time. It was agreed to by a vast majority. And that set the stage for 20 more years. This happened in 2000, 2001. That happened for 20 more years. We continued this formula, science, technology, loans. And somebody had a very smart idea. They said, you know, these Chinese companies are dinosaurs. They're state owned. They don't make much uh, progress. Why don't we help these Chinese companies to grow strong? <laughs> now you would think Americans would say, no, that would, how stupid can you get? If we help the Chinese companies, they're gonna outcompete with us and they'll dominate the world economy. No, that was not the right answer. So there's a wonderful book by a former treasury secretary under George W. Bush named Hank Paulson called Dealing with China. Hank Paulson describes with great pride how he taught the Chinese leaders and they were, they were astonished at the idea. You know, we can take a lot of your Chinese companies, like cell phone companies, you got about 10. Why don't you put them all together in one company and we will float it as an IPO in Wall Street on the New York Stock Exchange. And we, Goldman Sachs, value it at between five and 10 billion, and you'll get $10 billion. 
And the Chinese couldn't, they're looking for the trick. They're looking for the hook. Why would you do that? And Hank Paulson said, well, just make sure you do it through Goldman Sachs and not through Morgan Stanley or any other investment bank. So that was done. So, and I'll conclude on this point, Jeff. At that time in 2000, 2001, there was an annual fortune survey called the Fortune 500, the top companies in the world by valuation. At that time, America had most of the top companies. China had zero. By the time my book came out, I said, America is just barely ahead. China's closing in fast. Everybody said, that's stupid. The Chinese could never uh, surpass us in the number of major companies. You know what it is today? China has surpassed us in the number of highest uh, valuation corporations in the world. We are number two. We're declining even in that measure. And there's a couple other interesting measures. Remember I mentioned how poor China was 40 years ago? They were 10% of our GDP. So if you, if you have a physical measure, this is, this is the United States, this is China, 10%. Guess what it is today? China is better than 70 or even 80% of our GDP. By one measure the World Bank uses called purchase power parity, China has already surpassed us three years ago. They're ahead in various technological indicators like the most, the fastest supercomputers, a lot of advances in bio uh, pharmaceuticals. So the China we thought we were gonna help 40 years ago hasn't reformed. If anything, the share of the economy that's state controlled has gotten to be less private sector. Xi Jinping has now got himself named president for life, basically. Human rights lawyers in China. We used to think human rights lawyers in China, what a fantastic new indicator of progress in China. Why they have trials for political dissidents. No, that's all gone. Then we have the Uyghurs in a million plus so-called re-education centers. South China Sea, there's a very, very long list of Chinese misconduct. But the point of the 100 year marathon, the book, the history of how we got here is partly Chinese deception, partly our own self-deception, our own delusions, and our belief that everybody wants to be part of the world order, that everybody wants to be like America. How can the Chinese be so different? And one of the things that closed with this in the book one of the most, I visit China a lot. I was involved with a lot of these military guys and intelligence guys in China in the 80s and 90s when it was our policy. So I, I still know them and I get their books. They write a lot of books about the future. So I've done three books on Chinese views. Their main view is sooner or later, China is going to be by far the number one country in the world. But the main thing is not to wake up the Americans and scare them before we get there. So some Americans have awakened, but basically I would say the delusionary approach is still there. It's still fairly deeply held uh, inside our government and, and inside our Congress, and especially with our businessmen. <clears throat> the Chinese have pulled ahead of, ahead of us in an indicator of number of billionaires. Who would, who would have thought that the poor Chinese would end up with about 560 billionaires today, while well, we have roughly 530, 540. So in the billionaire gap, who has more billionaires? China. But when you visit China, who do, you, who do I see a lot of, and back here as well, deeply interested in China and being friends with China? Our billionaires, because they've made massive amounts of money over the last 20 or 30 years. So does that give you a incentive to try to buy a copy of the 100 year marathon it, it certainly does you have done a dr <laughs> Bill how Brain, we got a here <laughs> you, you've done a wonderful job of, of uh, delivering uh, just an excellent uh, and insightful uh, look at, at china over the last 40 years or so we're getting some questions in on our text line and on our email 
And the first question from our text line that we'd like to get to is a two-part question. Mm -hmm. What did the Trump administration get right and wrong with China? That's the first part. And then secondly, what can we expect under a Biden administration vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, those are, those are the number one questions here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I had a lot of contact with President Trump um, and discussed China with him a great deal. Uh, I left him out of the story, but he's a little bit like Jesse Helms in his view of China, but a different part of China. President Trump, as early as 2000, has a chapter in a book he wrote uh, attacking China as the greatest challenge in American history. One of his sentences is, our, the greatest challenge in our history is going to be China. And then he has some footnotes to articles about the China challenge. But his main focus at the time was trade, our companies being unfairly treated, um, our te the technology theft, how he said, if I'm president someday, I'll appoint myself to be in charge of trade. <laughs> and he pretty much did that. He micromanaged, he was personally involved in the trade war, if you will, the trade talks with China. He had many, many meetings himself. Uh, he talked to Xi Jinping on the phone uh, more than 20 times. He hosted Xi Jinping in Mar-a-Lago. So he took the trade focus as his main concern with China. He also said many times, Jeff, that if Hillary Clinton had won and not me, then China would be surpassing us now as the number one economy in the world. So he's very focused also on export controls, cracking down on technology. Unfortunately, when Rex Tillerson was Secretary of State, without checking with President Trump, he renewed in a written agreement, he renewed all the agreements with China to provide them American science and technology, to have their students come here. So President Trump would probably say he can't micromanage everything. He had to focus on the big issues. Now, in terms of Joe Biden, I think Biden has reversed himself. Biden was on the committee with Senator Helms uh, many, many, many years. I traveled myself as a Foreign Relations Committee staffer uh, with Joe Biden and Republican senators at the time. Biden went along with the consensus I'm describing to you. And in a famous interview about a year and a half ago, he remember the phrase, you know, they're not going to eat our lunch. Come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> they, they don't even know the East from the West over there and what they're going to do. That was the old view. The poor China that's going nowhere. Two weeks ago, Joe Biden gave an interview. I was quite delighted to hear this. He used that same expression, uh, eat our lunch. Only it wasn't China can't eat our lunch. It was China will eat our lunch. So Biden's staff, the briefings he's gotten have changed his view. And it's very rare in politics that you see a senator reverse himself, Jeff, <laughs> especially in public. Indeed. So now he's got some a series of reviews going on. There's one in the Pentagon. There's one for trade. He signed one yesterday. I was on the uh, Larry Kudlow show last night talking about this new Biden review for 100 days. He wants to see if we're vulnerable uh, in our supply chains for pharmaceuticals, chips, rare earths, and batteries. Uh, and of course we are. And President Trump worked on this too. So Biden could have attacked Trump and said, no, China is still our friend. But it looks like even Joe Biden, who obviously was leaning in the direction of being friends with China, even Joe Biden seems to have reversed himself. So I think that's good news. You're heartened by that effect. That was going to be a question I was going to ask you. Are you heartened by the fact that Biden has, has not reversed everything Trump in, uh, instituted over the four years he was president? Yeah, I'm very relieved. I'm very relieved. The Chinese, uh, two days ago, the Chinese foreign minister asked Biden publicly to take all the tariffs off. Because part of the trade deal, Trump is very tough on the Chinese. They said, look, we'll, we'll meet your standards. We'll buy more products. But you got to lift the tariffs on the day we sign. And Trump said, maybe. So they signed. And then Trump said, no, 
all the tariffs are still on. I was in the signing ceremony in the White House January 15th, a year ago when this happened. And the Chinese, it was the test of how tough they were because they could have walked out. In fact, some of us thought they would walk out. They didn't. They accepted that the tariffs would continue. It's a lot of tariffs. It's $300 billion worth of products. And President Trump re-channels that money into a Department of Agriculture Farmers Aid Program. I think it's almost $50 billion now. He's re-channeled to farmers who are hurt by some of the export cutbacks by China. So, so far, so good. We're getting a number of questions in now. I'd like maybe to do a lightning round as we get closer uh, to, <laughs> towards one o'clock. But by, this, this is the question. Biden sees China as a competitor as opposed to an adversary. What do you think it would take for him to see China as a hostile power? What would it take? That's a great question. It would take a military challenge. Uh, somehow in the area of trade, you know, if, there's a, if the FBI has another economic espionage case tomorrow, and arrest somebody who was stealing all kinds of plans or trade secrets. I don't think that would change President Biden's mind. It's the kind of like an ordinary new espionage case. Uh, most of the things China could do, let's say they line up some Uyghurs in the, in the re-education centers and they execute them on live TV. I don't think that's going to change Joe Biden's mind about China as an adversary because it's a huge step to go from competitor. The Chinese themselves, by the way, they say, we are competitors with America. We welcome competition with America. So when Joe Biden or anybody else says, we're going to compete with China, you know, or we're going to out-compete China, that's the Chinese line. <laughs> that's not some tough new approach. That's what the Chinese say. When someone says, we're going to stop Chinese cheating and theft and territorial claims in the South China Sea that the UN has said are false. When someone says we are going to increase the tariffs or we're going to close a Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas, which President Trump did, those are actions. Those are taken because of the idea that China is a strategic adversary. Joe Biden is not there yet. And, and the Chinese know this. I keep in touch with the Chinese. They think, obviously, they, they've, they think I've gone down the wrong path. They translated 100-year marathon, Jeff, into Chinese. Did they? They had a ceremony. It was, it was perfect. Nothing was removed. Um, and I opened the first page, and it said secret. And I said, wait a minute. This is a public book. You know what? I'm very grateful to you. The translation looks perfect. The cover looks just like this, only it has Chinese characters. Yes. And the two Chinese, the Chinese military, two generals wrote a preface for the book huh. saying, Dr. Pillsbury used to be one of China's friends. Oh. He made enormous contributions to U.S.-China relations. In recent years, he has lost his way. <laughs> so his book is secret only for senior Communist Party members and military officers. And I said, well, why is it secret? They said, chapter three. I, I was puzzled. Why chapter three? They said, because you expose all the cooperation between the CIA and the Chinese intelligence service. You expose how close we were and the Chinese people would be confused if they read about what Ronald Reagan was doing and how close we used to be. So this book in, is secret in China. I said, well, do I get any royalties? Because obviously <laughs> some of your books... You know, right. some books in China have 10 million copies sold, $1 per copy. They said, no, secret books do not provide royalties. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> Here's a question that came in on the text line. Should the U.S. bar mainland Chinese students, many whose parents are elites in the Chinese Communist Party, from studying in our colleges and universities because of espionage threats to our national security? What do you think about that one? Well, the topic is very important. There's been a lot of discussion in Congress as well as in the executive branch, what to do about these Chinese students. Uh, if you bar them all, you have our own university administrators march on Washington because the students, almost all of them pay full tuition. It could be 25,000 a year to 50, even 50,000 a year times 400,000. That's a lot of money. And most of these students are not spies. 
some of them are. The problem is we can't, it's hard to tell who is who. So there's been some concern also about the Chinese embassy and various Chinese organizations suppress or intimidate these students. Like you may want to have free speech and, and criticize Xi Jinping while you're here. Don't do it because we're keeping track. So generally speaking, there's been no movement toward cutting back the number of students. Um, there has been a lot of rhetoric, and this is the problem with, with China policy. Everybody's busy now making long lists of how evil China is. Uh, I've seen a list as, as long as 100, Jeff, bad things China does. Student spies. You know, some of these students do laboratory research, state of the art, and they have no shame in emailing back to China the findings in their state of the art laboratories where they're graduate students. Okay, that's bad. That joins the other 99 examples of Chinese misconduct. Everybody kind of agrees about this. The problem is, what do you do about it with a country that's almost our size, that has our political system deeply penetrated, <laughs> and has our businessmen essentially working for it? That they want more profits and they believe they can get them from China. So it's quite unrealistic to say, okay, yes, tomorrow we'll send all 400,000 of these Chinese students home. Damn it, they're all spies. That's very nice to say. It makes you feel good. Jesse Helms might like that. But Jesse Helms might say, what's our overall strategy toward China? Where are we going with this country? We obviously blew it for the last 40 years. What are we going to do? And let's have the students be part of the bigger strategy. And I don't think we have the grand strategy yet. President Trump made a lot of progress on it. Here's, here's a question for you. Would you discuss the threat the US faces in the South China Seas with China? Well, this is a strange problem. Uh, we don't have any claims ourselves in the South China Sea. So it's not like the Chinese military is building bases inside Alaska and Hawaii. These bases are going on little islands that they've built with money from American investors. <laughs> it was exposed a couple of years ago that the main Chinese company that was doing all the dredging uh, of the sand and wrecking the coral reefs in order to build these little islands so that the military could build bases on them, was being funded not only by American investors, but even by money from American federal and military pension funds because the pension fund managers uh, believed a briefing they got from a guy named Larry, a billionaire they got named Larry Fink. And he told them, look, it's, we need to make sure Chinese companies are involved in everybody's pension fund because China's growing rapidly. Nobody thought anything different about this. Toward the, in the last year of the Trump administration, President Trump changed it. There was another issue involving the South China Sea that is how, much are you going to penetrate Chinese waters? There's something called innocent passage, which is what we've been doing since the previous administration as well, where our ships go into Chinese claimed waters, but they turn off their radar, they go in a straight line, they make sure the Chinese can go with if they wish, and it's called innocent passage. It means you're, you, do, you accept the Chinese claim. This is what we've been doing so far. There's a, there's a case that with Japan, France, Britain, we ought to have more of these patrols and war in China. We don't accept your claim. Uh, and we agree with the UN decision that this, these waters are not yours. But so far, the Chinese have not backed down and they've only increased their military facilities in the South China Sea. And uh, under Obama even, uh, two aircraft carriers were sent together into the South China Sea our Secretary of Defense at the time, Ash Carter, made a speech from the deck of one of the carriers with the press televising the speech. And he talked about China's violating the UN decision by these activities. So President Trump didn't even go that far. He talked about possibly having more carriers. But the Navy is a little bit concerned that these carriers, when they get close to China, they're within range of a missile the Chinese have that can come down through the atmosphere at hypersonic speed and kill a carrier. And the Chinese have a lot of these missiles. 
By the way, this is an example I discussed in the book. 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, a lot of China experts said, China will never develop missiles like this to attack American aircraft carriers. If they even try, there's no way to come down through the atmosphere. It'll burn up. Number three, the carriers can go 30 knots or faster, so they'll be gone within the flight time of the Chinese missile. The carrier can move, you know, X number of miles away. Plus, the Chinese wouldn't want to do that because we're helping China so much, they wouldn't want to threaten our carriers. I was president at a lunch when an American admiral about eight or nine years ago announced, and it was a newspaper story, he announced that the counter aircraft carrier missile of China was now operational. So a lot of our Navy leaders are not eager to sail gigantic carriers with 5,000 sailors on board each one, and we only have 11. If, and if we lose one to a Chinese missile, then what do we do? Attack China? A lot of people would say, yes, how dare they? And in my book, I show the number of Chinese military officers who've been writing about this, why the Americans only understand force. And so taking out one of their aircraft carriers, if it's in Chinese claims, and they claim the whole South China Sea. So we're there all the time. <laughs> that we have to do this to teach the Americans basically who's the number one power in the world. So this is another, this is another area where you think, you know, yeah, let's send up to China. You know, you shouldn't do these bad things in the South China Sea. I think Jesse Helms and Admiral Nance would say, you better have a strategy first, because what happens when the Chinese say, really? Mm. We're gonna be there tomorrow. <laughs> it's a very powerful country. And we still have many people, Jeff, who say China's gonna collapse. They're weak, supposedly. They have all kinds of problems, too many old people, uh, the water's polluted, the environment's polluted, they don't have, they have, don't have enough pigs because of viruses, you know, the place is falling apart. And this is a nightmare for people like me or President Trump who want to do something about China. Because the more these people say China is going to collapse, the more they take away any incentive and they make everybody complacent and go back to, well, gee, if China is going to collapse, if they're so weak, why don't we help them some more? <laughs> Let me ask you to look into your crystal ball. That's what this question does here. If the U.S. continues to take a hard line on China, how do you think uh, the country will react over the next four years? You mean America or China? China. Yeah. How do you think China will react? Well, the, first of all, the Chinese do not believe we're taking a hard line on them. And the Chinese are right. We are not taking a hard line on them. The, le the level of tariffs that President Trump originally talked about was double or triple the level he actually put on. Uh, you, we already discussed the 400,000 students. That number is going up. I mentioned Secretary of State Tillerson signing the agreement in 2017 to continue the scientific cooperation. So our Pentagon still considers the war on terror, Iran, North Korea, these are the main threats. Ret verbally, verbally, rhetorically, Pentagon leaders say, well, China is the main challenge. Our new Secretary of Defense, Austin, has called it the pacing threat. But everybody sort of knows the Pentagon doesn't really have a plan for how do we shift from being able to kill terrorists in Afghanistan and Iraq or stop a North Korean invasion, or stop an Iranian attack in the Gulf, how do we shift our military toward a war with China? And nobody wants to even talk about it. Look, look how that makes chills on the back of your neck. War with China, Jeff. We don't want that, right? Nobody wants war with China. But we've had a war with China in 1950, where, which I cover in the book, and in my next book, I'm going into even more detail, the CIA wrote memos to President Truman, the Chinese are not going to intervene in North Korea. <laughs> and this was to, given to President Truman when the Chinese were already inside North Korea. They doubled, tripled, quadrupled their forces. They finally had 300,000, and they had a surprise attack. American soldiers and Marines had to escape being surrounded and ambushed by almost 300,000 Chinese in wintertime. 
So the Chinese love this story. Americans are not so tough. We beat them in 1950. You can get Chinese to say that. Many of them are written in their books. So the question is wrong to say we have a hard line on China. What's going to be the reaction in four years? <clears throat> it's just simply wrong. We don't have a hard line on China. We talk a lot about how bad China is. But my forecast is, my crystal ball says the number of Chinese billionaires is going to keep going up. The Chinese GDP growth rate is going to exceed us. It's going to exceed us. They're going to be double our economy in 15 or 20 years or, or less. So we're heading down the wrong path. And God bless Jesse Helms for sticking to his guns at the time. But we have to forgive Admiral Nance because he's going along with the consensus and President Reagan uh, <clears throat> at the time. So I have to reject this question. that We're not taking a hard line on China yet. I remember the story that you told me that Helms was the lone vote in the Senate on weapon sales. To China, that's right. To, to China. <laughs> he stood and I out. Was sent up. I was sent to lobby him. I was President Reagan's policy planning chief in the Pentagon. And they said, you used to work for Jesse Helms. I said, yes. He said, well, we, we need, we don't want to, this, we want this vote to be unanimous. It's only Helms. So I actually met with Senator Helms. I had two Chinese with me, the Chinese defense attache, who's a general and a visiting Chinese from Beijing. And we had a talk in the Senator's dining room and Senator Helms, as he always is, he's very courteous. He shook their hands. He said, oh, you know, I've never met anybody from red China before. <laughs> and then they said, Senator, you know, we really need you to, support China, US-China relations. And Senator Helms said something priceless. He said, you know, I really admire the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and he did not waver, did he? No. One final text I will share with you, and it's not really in the form of a question, but more of a, a validation of what you've been saying. This is a retired purchasing manager for a metal working company in the Carolinas. Ah. And he says, I totally agree with everything you've said. We found that the Chinese manufacturing equipment far, uh, we found their manufacturing equipment far superior to ours, primarily financed by U.S. banks. Right. So we took a back seat, laid off numerous workers, and it's getting worse. Well, will he, will he give his name? I want him to identify himself. So I know I have at least one supporter in your audience. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe off camera. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts before we bring uh, President Rogers back to the, to the uh, call here? Well, I would underline the importance of history. That trying to understand problems today, you're always tempted just to read the newspaper and take a position. But no matter what the issue is, understanding how we got here is often very hard and often very sad to read the stories of who thought what uh, back to 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. So I hope you will be interested in hearing about my next book because I'm going even deeper into the history of US-China relations. <laughs> Thank you. Let me unmute myself here, but I want to thank you, Dr. Pillsbury, for uh, speaking with us today. It's uh, very sobering, and um, I think more people need to hear this. And we're going to take uh, what you've said today and, and give to a lot of people I know couldn't be with us at noon uh, uh, to listen to. And also invite you with your next book. And we have over 2 million items in the Senator Helms archives. So if you need to do some research or have a research assistant, please uh, come and, and we'd love to, to host you and um, relive a little history. It's quite fascinating to be uh, in, those, in those stacks. Thank you. Uh, I okay. want to uh, thank everybody for participating. And uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, we'll, we'll do a follow-up email with everyone and uh, include the link so you can watch it again, share with your friends. And also, we'll include a link of uh, where you can buy Dr. Pil Pillsbury's book that he references so much uh, in his in his talk. It is um, it, it ought to be it's must reading. If you I wouldn't read it at night so much. You want to go to sleep. Your heart your heart rate may go up a little bit more uh, with that. Page, but, uh, sure but I would encourage 100. you to uh, purchase that and look forward when his new book comes out. Uh, we'll let you know.
I want to thank you all for attending. And again, I want to thank the Pope Foundation for their sponsorship of this lecture series. And we hope to be in person in May for a lunch. That, that's our goal. And so I uh, appreciate you and you all have a great afternoon and be safe and look forward to uh, seeing you in person in the very near future. Thank you.